Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Expanding the Limits of Shotgun Proteomics Using Micropillar Array Columns and Data Independent Acquisition Methods. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this web seminar presented by LCGC and sponsored by Pharmafluidics and Biognosis. Pharmafluidics is a spin-off of the Chemical Engineering Department at the Free University of Brussels under Professors Gert Desmet and Wim de Malsche. Pharmafluidics is bringing to market a game-changing technology in analytical chromatography for biomarker discovery and the analytical development of biopharmaceuticals. Their micropack columns are made by etching and have a separation bed of highly ordered and freestanding pillars. Due to this unique design, the micropack columns have the capacity to offer high separation power even for tiny biological samples with an excellent level of resolution, unprecedented robustness, and unrivaled reproducibility. Biognosis AG is a leader in next generation proteomics dedicated to transforming life sciences research by making the most advanced proteomics tools available to researchers. Biognosis offers a suite of products and services to decode the proteome and equip researchers from all fields with a deep understanding of protein expression and quantification in a biological system. We have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started today. First, the webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of your window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the webcast. And if you have any technical problems today viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jeff Optebeek and Dr. Jan Muntel. Jeff Optebeek was Pharmafluidics' first full-time employee. His PhD work under the supervision of Professors Gert de Smet and Wim de Malsche formed the basis for the current Micropillar Array column, which is branded by Pharmafluidics as the Micropack. He holds a master's degree in biomedical sciences from the University of Antwerp and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Brussels. He currently holds the position of Application Development Manager at Pharmafluidics. Jan Muntel has been employed as a senior scientist on the R&D team of Biognosis AG since 2016. He has long-standing experience in quantitative proteomics. His work at Biognosis is focused on the development and benchmarking of new LCMS workflows. He holds a PhD from the University of Greifswald and was a postdoctoral researcher for four years at Harvard Medical School. Thank you both for joining us today. Jeff, please go ahead and get us started. Thank you, Laura, for the kind introduction, and thanks again for giving us the opportunity to set up this webinar to present and explain our innovative approach to making nano-LC columns, and more specific about the benefits they can bring to single-shot proteomics using data-independent acquisition methods, which will be covered by Dr. Jan Muntel from Biognosis. I also want to welcome and thank the participants for their time and interest in our product and technology. This is what we will be covering today. First of all, I will give an overview of the Micropillar Array column technology and the analytical performance of the products we are offering. Then Jan will take over and start with an introduction to data independent acquisition methodology, after which he will cover the benchmark of data independent acquisition, the optimization for Micropillar Array columns, and comprehensive single shot analysis of HeLa samples into more detail. Finally, we will both be available for answering any questions you may have. At Pharmafluidics, we use a fundamentally different approach to make chromatographic columns. This allows introducing perfect order into the separation bed. Now let's first look at the design of traditional LC columns. The stationary phase of traditional columns consists of a bed of microparticles that have been packed into a cylinder or capillary tube. These particles have a certain size distribution and thus a degree of heterogeneity. On top of that, their location in the column is more or less random, at best not perfectly ordered. As illustrated in the bottom figure, this disorder will lead to additional dispersion as the sample migrates through the column. The fact that, that not all flow paths in the column are identical will cause sample molecules to have slightly different retention times, causing additional dispersion. 
Pharmafluidics uses a different approach to fabricate their chromatographic beds or columns. Instead of using particles that are packed into a tube or capillary, the backbone of the stationary phase is designed in a similar way that electronic circuits or sensors are designed. State-of-the-art lithographic techniques followed by silicon etching are used. <coughs> These channels are filled with accurately positioned ordered arrays of pillars which form the backbone of the stationary phase. This results in two important benefits. First of all, virtually perf perfect order is achieved, hereby reducing the eddy dispersion to an absolute minimum. This is again illustrated in the bottom figure, where you can see that all sample molecules will follow identical flow paths throughout the entire column. An additional benefit of this format comes from the fact that the pillars are freestanding and positioned at an accurately defined distance from each other. This has a serious impact on the column permeability and enables us to provide very long columns that can be operated at moderate pressures. The benefit of order versus disorder is clearly illustrated in these animated simulations that have been generated in Professor Geerte Smith's group and that form the basis for the current micropillar array column. In the disordered case, the sample plug gradually disperses as it migrates to the stationary phase, resulting in significant broadening um, during the separation. Whereas in the ordered case, the sample plug remains nicely conserved and the intensity um, remains high, resulting in improved resolution and higher signal-to-noise ratios. Now, to make long columns on limited footprint, the columns need to be folded. The current production process is based on 4-inch silicon wafers, one of which is shown in the middle picture. And on such a wafer, we realize three 2-meter long columns and two 50-centimeter long columns. A 2-meter column actually consists of 40 discrete lanes that are interconnected by 180-degree turns, finally resulting in a 2-meter long meandering or serpentine channel. Making microfluidic turns without introducing additional dispersion is quite difficult because the racetrack effects where the inner lane is shorter than the outer one need to be avoided. To avoid these effects, we use proprietary flow distribution and collection structures at the beginning and at the end of each lane. Then, at the bottom of this slide, we gradually zoom in upon the pillar surface from right to left. Once the pillar structures have been etched, they are rendered superficially porous to increase the effective interaction surface. The final result are channels filled with 5 micrometer diameter pillars, positioned at a distance of 2.5 micrometer, the, he the height of each pillar is 20 micrometer and the cross-section of the lanes is equivalent to a circular capillary with a diameter of about 85 micrometer, or 58 micrometer. The porous layer is around 300 nanometers thick and the average pore diameter is estimated at about 10 to 30 nanometers. The bonded phase for the current products is C18. A feature that was very helpful during the research and development phase is that our columns have a transparent glass cover lid, allowing us to follow what happens inside the column using fluorescence imaging systems and fluorescent dyes. The first video shows a real-time injection of a fluorescent dye into the column. It illustrates nicely how the injection is controlled by the flow distributor in order to uniformly distribute the sample over the relatively wide separation bed and how the separation bands remain nicely straight and parallel. The second video shows how the proprietary collection and distribution structures allow to conserve the sample plugs in a 180 degree turn. What we see here is not a real-time separation, but instead a number of sequential low-volume injections. Combining these two principal cap capabilities, we can provide very long columns that maintain sharp peaks. Now let's have a look at the performance that can be achieved by using these columns. In this slide, we compared a 50 cm long micropack column to two state-of-the-art commercially available nano-LC columns, which are widely used among proteomic labs. As our 50 cm column is ideally suited to perform relatively short analysis, we compared it to 15 cm long pack bed alternatives. The sample used was a HeLa digest and it was separated using short gradients ranging from 30 to 90 minutes. As can be seen from the top two chromatograms, 
The micro pack column was operated at two different flow rates, whereas the pack bed columns were only operated at a flow rate of 300 nanoliters per minute. The top bar chart displays the average peak width that could be obtained for a retention time calibration mixture that was spiked into the HeLa sample. Compared to both packed bed columns, a clear reduction of the peak width could be achieved. What also stands out is the pump pressure needed to operate these columns. As you can see in the bottom chart, the pressure needed to operate a 50 cm micropack column at a flow rate of 300 nanoliters per minute is only 40 bar, whereas both packed bed columns delivered column back pressures exceeding 250 bar for this flow rate. Because of the low back pressure, 50 cm long micropack columns can be operated over a wide range of flow rates going from 0.1 to 2 microliter per minute. In this case, an example of operation at 1 microliter per minute is given. As can be seen from the charts shown on this slide, the increase in chromatographic performance also translates into an increase in peptide and protein identification, especially for short gradient times with a total analysis time within 60 minutes where more than double the amount of peptides and 72% more proteins could be identified when operating the 50 cm micropack column at a flow rate of 1 microliter per minute. In another set of experiments, we benchmarked our long column, the 200 cm long micropack column, towards a longer 50, uh, 40 cm pack bed column. On this slide, base peak chromatograms obtained for the separation of a human embryonic kidney uh, cell sample have been compared. The top one displayed in orange was obtained on the 40 cm pack bed column, whereas the bottom one displayed in blue was obtained on the micro pack column. A quick inspection of the chromatograms already suggests that more features would be detected in the top chromatogram. These assumptions were confirmed once data had been processed, with a total of 3034 um, protein groups identified with the micro pack column compared to 2,334 protein groups with the 40 cm pack bed column. Both columns were operated at a flow rate of 300 nanoliters per minute and at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. For the micro pack column, this resulted in an average column back pressure of 75 bars, uh, and for the pack bed column, this resulted in a back pressure of 445 bars. Now let's have a look at the chromatographic performance for these long columns. The peptide peak widths obtained for the separation of these uh, samples have been plotted as a function of the gradient time. For short uh, solvent gradients, similar peak widths were obtained for both columns. But when extending the gradient time beyond two hours, there is a clear difference between both column types. This becomes even more obvious when the average peak width is plotted uh, the rate at which the peak width increases according to the gradient time is much lower for the micro pack column as compared to the pack bed column. But how does this translate again into peptide and protein identifications? A 30 to 50 percent in peptide IDs could be achieved over the entire range of injections with the lowest amount of 100 nanograms shown to the left and the highest amount of 3 micrograms shown to the right. On the protein level, this resulted in a consistent increase in identifications of 20 to 30 percent. Extending gradient times beyond four hours definitely has a positive effect when working with a micropack column, ultimately delivering over 5,000 protein and 40,000 peptide identifications for a long gradient ran on an Orbitrap Elite instrument and this in data-dependent acquisition mode. With a column volume of 3 microliter and a flow rate range from 0.1 to 2 microliter per minute, the 50 cm micropack column is ideally suited to perform more routine analysis where increased throughput is needed. To serve those who are aiming at comprehensive proteome coverage, Formafluidics offers the 200 cm long micropack column with a volume of 9 microliter and a respective flow rate range of 0.1 to 1 microliter per minute. What is also quite important is the configuration needed to connect the column properly to ECMS instrumentation. Because the column is mainly made out of silicon, which is a semiconductor, a dramatic impact on the chromatographic behavior of micropack has been observed if no proper precautions are taken to shunt the high voltage to ground. 
The schematic drawings on this slide clearly show how the column should be connected and this for three different electrospray ionization configurations. The column is provided with two stainless steel unions. On the inlet side, a uh, standard 360 micrometer uh, outer diameter tubing can be connected without introducing any depth volume. And at the exit side, a union with a 50 micrometer true bore is provided to properly ground the column and protect it from the high voltages applied for electrospray ionization. For those who are working with a thermoscientific easy spray ionization source, we also offer a micro pack compa compatible easy spray emitter that can easily be connected to the micro pack column end fitting. This closes my part on the micro pack column technology. I'm very pleased now to hand over the floor to Dr. Jan Muntel, who will share his experience with our micro pack columns in combination with data independent com uh, acquisition methodology. But I think it's first time for some polling questions. Is that correct, Laura? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much, Jeff. I would indeed like to ask all of you in the audience to participate in two very brief polling questions. And the questions are on your the first question is on your screen, and you can click directly on your screen to enter your answers. So here's the first question. What do you currently find to be the most challenging aspect of applying nano LC methods for deep proteomic analysis? Maximizing LC resolution, limited sample availability, maximizing the number of identifications, maximizing the plate number, reducing the runtime, maximizing reproducibility, or increasing column stability. So once again, you can click directly on your screen to enter your answers. And once again, here's that question. What do you currently find to be the most challenging aspect of applying nano LCMS for deep proteomic analysis? Maximizing LC resolution, limited sample availability, maximizing the number of identifications, maximizing the plate number, reducing the runtime, maximizing reproducibility, or increasing column stability? All right, let's pull up those answers. Okay, so it looks like by far the number one answer is maximizing the number of identifications. Jeff, did you have any comment on those results? Yeah, so I think maximizing the number of identification is indeed something that, that can be achieved by using our, our very long column, eh, the 200 centimeter micropack column, and ru then running it with very long solvent gradient times. But I think also, uh, the data independent acquisition methodology of biognosis will uh, will help to do so. So I think now uh, we can uh, go further to, uh, to the part of Jan. Excellent. Before we do that, we just have one more quick question for the audience, one more polling question. So that is now on your screen. And again, you can click directly on your screen to enter your answers. So here's that question. Which is your preferred quantitative proteomics workflow? Label-free workflow based on DDA methods, Isotopic labeling workflow, SILAC, TMT, ITRAC, SRM, MRM, or PRM-based quantification using labeled peptide standards, AQUA, label-free workflow based on DIA methods, or I'm not working in the field of proteomics. So once again, click directly on your screen to enter your answers. And those, that question is, which is your preferred quantitative proteomics workflow? Label-free workflow based on DDA methods, Isotopic labeling workflow, SILAC, TMT, or ITRAC. SRM, MRM, or PRM-based quantification using labeled peptide standards, AQUA. A label-free workflow based on DIA methods, or I'm not working in the field of proteomics. All right, let's pull up those answers. I'm not seeing the answers come up on my screen. So let's us just let's just move on. Um, Jan, why don't you take over and head, t t sorry, do your part of the presentation? Thank you very much for the introduction. So welcome to the second part of this webinar about the expanding the limits of single shot proteomics using micropillary columns and data independent acquisition methods. At the beginning, I would like to briefly uh, introduce our company. So we are typically working on discovery proteomics project. That can be biomarker discovery, drug target discovery, mode of action studies, as well as drug target deconvolution studies, or we also do studies where we look into post-translational modifications. For the kind of samples, we basically work with almost all types of body fluids, for example, plasma or urine, 
but we uh, have also long-standing experience with tissue or cell line samples. These samples can be derived from a whole bunch of different um, organisms as human, mouse, rats, but they also had some plants or bacterial um, proteomes um, projects. Now, our experiments can be rather small, so just comprised of six samples, but we have also some projects where we look into hundreds of different samples that can be time course experiments, treatments, uh, and other studies. For all of these uh, studies, we have some key requirements into our technology. One is uh, we want to uh, have a high proteome coverage that also goes along with high sensitivity. We want highly reproducible um, uh, high reproducible technology, um, high quantitative precision, and also the approach needs to be scalable. So to make sure that everyone is on the same page, uh, so when I talk now about bottom-up or shotgun proteomics, the main challenge is that usually uh, proteins are very large molecules and very heterogeneous in their physical chemical properties, so they are not easily analyzable in, uh, with one approach. Therefore, we digest proteins into peptides, uh, basically cut them down into smaller units, and quantify uh, later on the peptides as proxy for the proteins. The peptide uh, properties are typically rather small, 7 to 25 amino acids, very homogeneous in the chemical properties, so they can be analyzed with the same analytical setup, usually stable and easy to handle. Um, typically, in the field of proteomics, ma many people use, uh, or in the past, use data-dependent acquisition methods. So what's basically comprised is that after chromatographic separation of the peptides, uh, MS1 service scan is acquired, which, in which um, an overview is generated of the peptides present in the sample. Then one uh, peptide is uh, se selected and for fragmentation, and then MS2 spectra is uh, acquired of it, which basically delivers the sequence information of these peptides. Um, you typically, the peptides are chosen uh, by the intensity in the MS1 spectrum. This can lead, uh, as you can see in the small little map, to a semi stochastic sample of the sample. So that basically a lot of peptides cannot be analyzed because the scan speed of the mass spectrometer is not high enough. For that reason, we turned, into, uh, turned to use uh, data independent acquisition methods. Um, the chromatographic separation is basically the same, then the MS1 scan is acquired, and then the whole mass range is fragmented in different windows. This results basically in very complex MS2 spectra, but on the upside, we can achieve a comprehensive, comprehensive sample of the whole, comprehensive sampling of the whole sample. So people might ask why it's that important, so therefore I'd like to show this picture. So here you can see uh, a giraffe walking and uh, walking around. It looks like a very idyllic picture, but if you really uh, increase the resolution and data points of this picture, you can actually see that the line shows up, so it actually comes down to a question of life and death for this giraffe. So as you can achieve comprehensive sampling and data independent acquisition methods, um, the new challenge uh, approaches, and that is to interpret the complex MS2 spectra. For that, um, we use the pep, so-called peptide-centric analysis using a library. The library, also called ion library or spectral library, is a repository of previously acquired peptide sequences, fragment ions, including their intensities and basically retention times. In the first step of the analysis, um, the software tools detect the peaks in the MS2 spectra. Then uh, extract and ion chromatograms are generated on MS1 and MS2 level. They are matched together and then scored. Then FDA estimation is done. And later on, also, um, these intensities can be used for quantification of the peptides. All of these algorithms are actually implemented in our Spectronaut software. To benchmark the DIA method, we started off using a HeLa sample, uh, QExactive HF mass spectrometer. Um, and uh, filtered the results on a 1% FDR on peptide and protein level. What you can see here is the gray line, um, which is basically the number of theoretically possible uh, acquired, or uh, the number of spectrons that can be theoretically acquired by the mass spectrometer, so it increased linearly with increasing of the gradient length. 
the blue light blue line basically shows how many spectra are actually acquired by the mass spectrometer. So for short gradients, it's pretty close to what is theoretically possible. But as longer gradients, uh, there's a bigger gap between that. And in uh, dark blue or purple, um, that is the, nu the number of spectra that were actually identified. Uh, in our lab, this using the samples, and in orange, you can see what one of the best labs achieved in acquired. So still just around 30 to 70 percent of all spectra actually identified at the end. In contrast to that, in red, you can see how many peptides were identified with the DIA approach. It is um, within the range usually uh, of double the number of identification compared to the DDA approach. And if you look at, uh, especially at short gradients, you can see that there are more peptides actually identified with DIA approach than are theoretically identifiable um, with the DDA method. With that, we were also very interesting how well it performs in terms of quantification. Therefore, we used the mixed proteome sample in which uh, different proteomes are spiked into the sample in different uh, predefined ratios. Use the same mass spectrometer for that. And the summary of the results you can see here. Uh, one is uh, using the MS1 information of the DIA experiment. One using is the D MS2 information of the DIA experiment. And for DDA experiment, only MS1 information is available for label-free quantification. What you can see here is basically that for all predefined ratios, the DIA MS2 is closest to the predefined levels. And uh, actually, meaning the accuracy is pretty high of the quantification. Also, if you look at the width of the box plot, they are also the smallest for the DIA MS2 approach, meaning that also the precision is pretty high. So, so with that, we, we, uh, you, the, all the results I showed you so far were acquired on a 50 centimeter in-house pack column with sub 2 micrometer silica particles. So in a standard experiment, we are able to uh, quantify between 5 and 6,000 proteins with a two-hour gradient. But uh, for comprehensive coverage, a lot of people in the field say that around 10,000 proteins and you achieved a comprehensive coverage, so we are still around just 50 to 60 percent of that, even though there are more than 60,000 NR transcripts um, described in mammalian cell, still the 10,000 is kind of the number to, to achieve. And for a single shot proteome analysis at this point, you only have the chance to increase the gradient length. We also try to use longer gradient, but then uh, longer columns, but then we quickly uh, reach the upper pressure limit of the LC. So that is uh, the plot that I showed before already. So with increasing gradient lengths, we are uh, able to identify more and more peptides. But as you can see already, that with longer gradient, the increase in identification doesn't keep up with um, um, additional time spent on the separation. It becomes more obvious by plotting the IDs per minute. So the most efficient setup is basically one hour gradient, but after that, the uh, precursor identification per minute are continuously dropping, and then four hour gradient actually it's less than half compared to the one hour gradient. So why is that? So therefore, we can see here an overview about the full width and half max of the separation, which basically increase linearly with uh, a longer gradient. And we also um, see a plot together the T capacities that were achieved within this gradient, you can see by doubling the gradient from 30 to 60 minutes, we gain 100 in peak capacity. Doubling from 60 to 2 hours is 100 more. And doubling from 2 to 4 hours is again 100 more. Um, next slide, please. So then um, the limitation becomes more obvious if you plot the identifications uh, per peak capacity. So what you can see, it's basically constant. So that means actually if we are able to increase the peak capacity um, for this, um, for this uh, LC setup, we are also able to increase the proteomic coverage. That is actually why we decided to try out the micropack column. So we started off with a 200 centimeter micropack column, which is the most promising column for high uh, proteome coverage. We operated it at 300 nanometer per minute and heated up to 50 degrees. It is primarily to 
uh, be able to equilibrate and load the samples at higher flow rates to increase the um, efficiency of the setup a bit. We use a thermo easy nano LC, a thermo nano spray, flex ion source is using stainless steel uh, emitters, and a, a Q executive HFX mass spectrometer. That is how it looks like in, in our laboratory. So within the um, yeah, beige brown bag, you can see the columns. So it's actually hidden inside the heater, and it's connected to our HFX um, mass spectrometer, which uh, for, um, listens to the name of ground talk. Therefore, you can see the small little animals on it. Before we actually looked into the performance of the uh, column, we uh, started to optimize the gradients. For that, we started off with a linear gradient and um, calculated, based on the ID results, a nonlinear gradient. So the main purpose of that, you can see here, so we want to achieve an equal uh, illusion of all peptides across the whole separation space. If you look at the black bars, uh, you can see there is a drop in IDs, the uh, retention time bin uh, with a linear gradient at the end, and this is more even uh, using a nonlinear gradient. Another point why you want to do that is um, we look at the full width half max distribution of the peptide diluting. You can see that um, with the linear gradient, there are some differences across, uh, among the separation. So with longer, with later retention time, the peak actually is broadening. And if you look uh, in the nonlinear gradient, we can actually achieve an almost um, well, the peak the full width half max stays the same across the whole separation space which is very crucial for the optimization of the DIA method that will continue on later. So we did the same experiment for the four and six hour gradient, and for the eight hour gradient, um, we derived the gradient from the six hour gradient. So that are the first initial data that we acquired using HeLa sample. So we're actually uh, quite happy with the results, so we got um, even already in two hours, we were identified to, uh, able to identify about 100,000 precursors. And uh, most impressive was actually that the peak capacity increased in an almost linear way from the two to the eight hour gradient. And then we compared it also to an in house pack column. There you could see that actually the uh, full width half max is very similar for a two hour gradients and also the peak capacities, but this longer um, gradients. Actually, you can see that um, the peak width of the uh, micro pack column increased uh, less than compared to the in house pack column. So then we also looked again into the how many identifications for peak capacity were achieved. We could see actually that this is also an almost stable line, with the exception of the eight hour time point, but for that, um, we know that we didn't really optimize the DIA method for the eight-hour gradient, so therefore it's a suboptimal method. But uh, these initial results showed us already that the micropack column provides us with very high peak capacities for long gradients. With that, we started off to optimize the uh, micropack DIA workflow, starting with the peptide loading on column. The next step will be about the optimization of the DIA method, um, and then uh, I will briefly uh, say how we generated an optimized library. The readout, uh, how we evaluate uh, the success of this was to increase the number of uh, the identified precursors, peptides, and proteins using a healer sample. And with optimized method, we also uh, looked into the quantitative position using replicate ones. So uh, usually uh, loading is around two micrograms of peptides. Um, this is a summary where we uh, try to double the loading from two to four, and for the long gradients also from four to six microgram loading. What you could see here is that we get a roughly an increase of um, four to five, four to six percent using double the, or using an increased loading from two microgram to four microgram, but then further increase to six microgram um, actually didn't lead to more identification. Therefore, we concluded that four microgram loading is optimal to maximize identifications. So the DIA method strongly depends on the peak width of the chromatography, which basically depends uh, determines the data points per peak for the uh, quantification method. So for that, the uh, cycle time is crucial. And um, we looked entry into it uh, in this publication uh, uh, from uh, Buda et al. And there um, we figured out that using 
um, um, using a readout of uh, peptide identification with a CV below 20%, that actually eight data points per peak at deal for a DIA method. Um, it was in this application, there was a slightly different definition of the data points per peak, therefore it went late actually to five data points per peak in a spectrum out experiment. Therefore, for our experiment, we uh, try to aim for five data points per peak. The cycle time for an orbitrap and an analyzer basically depends on the scan revolution, as well as the number of scans or DIA windows. So, for example, for a two-second cycle time, it's possible to either acquire 60 scans at 15K, 30 scans at 30K resolution, or 15 scans at 60K resolution. So, in terms of selectivity, with the most number of windows, the 15K, the selectivity is the highest, so the MS2 spectra are the least complex. But uh, during the acquisition of the scan, the mass spectrometer is not ideal. It starts to uh, collect the ions for the next scan. Therefore, if they have a longer scan, there's more time to collect enough ions. So therefore, theoretically, a higher scan resolution can uh, lead to higher injection times and therefore higher sensitivity. For shorter gradients, around two hours and less, you usually have 30K resolution. Turned out to be uh, ideal, so a number of IDs. But for longer gradients, uh, we don't really know what's the perfect. Therefore, it needs to be determined experimentally. So for that, uh, you can see the results here. So we tried two different methods, one 30K and one 60K method, where we have on the 30K method 60 to 75 windows, and 30 to 36 windows is the 60K method. And basically, for all gradients, um, method using 30K resolution and lead to more, more, most identification. For the six hour gradient, there's not a big difference, but for the four and eight hours, it was uh, clearly beneficial to use the 30K method. Um, and as a readout for the data points per peak, it actually turned out that for the four hour gradient, um, we achieved the goal pretty well to uh, get five data points per peak. For the six hour methods, we are very close to it. We just see a little bit shift of the box plot to higher data points per peak, so there's a little bit room for improvement. For the eight-hour um, method, we still have all the time to use more uh, DIA windows. Um, for the uh, future, um, we actually decided to use the six-hour gradient because it seemed to be the best compromise of IDs and uh, sample throughput. Um, as I mentioned already in the introduction, for the target analysis of the DIA data, a library is required containing peptide sequences, fragment ion information, as well as retention time, or better to say normalized retention time, or IITs. This library is uh, typically acquired on a, using high pH reverse phase fractionation. And this is quite obvious that the library size is very important, so you need to cover um, as many proteins and peptides as possible to uh, in the library to identify them in the DAA run. Also, the retention time actually is pretty crucial. So this is something you can see here in the upper graph. Um, we, acquire, uh, we analyzed the same HeLa sample using a library that was generated on a different LCMS setup. So a medium extraction risk in which the uh, software starts to look for the peaks was uh, around 33 minutes in a six hour gradient, which translates to 18% of the gradient. And uh, analyzing the same sample with a project specific HeLa library on the same setup actually reduced this window to 4% of the gradient. As it is not so easy to compare identification bet um, between different libraries, um, they can also differ which fragment ions are in there and so on. We actually did an in silico experiment, basically adding noise to the IRT, to make them artificially more imprecise. And the results you can see here, um, the zero is basically the high precision IRTs without any noise added. And the more noise is actually added to the retention time, the least, the less uh, peptides get identified. So that actually leads to the conclusion that um, um, having um, the library or made the li library generation on the same LC setup actually improves the identification results. So with that, um, we wanted to push it to the limits. 
For that, we started off again with the HeLa sample, used the six-hour gradient, loaded four micrograms uh, of peptides. We further optimized the DAA method using 90 windows and 30K resolution. We acquired uh, as a project-specific HeLa library using uh, 15 high pH reverse phase fractions. And the library comprised more than 300,000 precursors and uh, slightly more than 10,000 protein groups. We have actually generated a very deep library. And we did triplicate injections to access the quantitative precision. That's an overview of the results. So we're actually able to identify 9,123 uh, proteins per, on average per run. This all is uh, filtered by a 1% FDR on protein level. Uh, in total, in the experiment with the three replicates, we identified 9,173 proteins. And the IDs between the ones were reproducible. So the run with the least IDs was 9,121. And uh, with the highest IDs, 9,124. We were able to cover more than four orders of magnitude. Um, then we also calculated the CV based on the triplicate injection. So the median CV across the whole dynamic range was 6%. But we were also interested how it, um, the CV behaves in different abundance regions. Therefore, we just uh, split the dynamic range into three um, the parts using the high abundant, medium abundant, and lowly abundant proteins. And there we could see that actually even the low abundant protein range, we still achieve CVs in the range of 10%. And this drops down to 4% for the high the abundant proteins. So this results are actually among the highest ever reported protein IDs within a single shot analysis using 1% protein FDR. So to give you a better imp uh, impression of the data reproducibility, you can see here a heat plot, heat map representation of the three runs. They are basically look the same with only very minor differences. And also, if you look in the number of um, quantified proteins with the CV below 20%, we almost were able almost to identify 8,000 proteins with it. And if you look at the data set complete this, you had more than 9,000 proteins quantified in all three runs, resulting into a data set completeness of higher than 99%. So in summarize, we actually achieved a very high reproducible, very high reproducible and precise quantification on a whole proteome scale. So to give you a little bit an impression of, of what is possible with this kind of data set, um, we did some enrichment analysis of the highly, medium, and lowly abundant pro uh, proteins. Here's the overview about the highly abundant proteins. They can cover, for example, DNA replication proteins and also the oxidative phosphorylation chain. And STAR always marked the proteins that were quantified. We actually were able to achieve a high coverage of major metabolic pathways and cell growth-related pathways. For median abundant proteomes, um, you can see a representation of uh, pancreatic cancer, which sounds a little bit odd in the first moment to look into this pathway for a HeLa cell line, but it's basically just a representation that we can actually achieve a good coverage also of disease-related pathways. Um, for the lowly abundant proteins, we, for example, saw some signaling pathways here, a picture of the toll-like receptor signaling pathways, so that led to the conclusion that we can also get a good coverage of signaling and regulatory pathways, including some transcription factors, which are usually very lowly abundant and therefore hard to quantify. To conclude, um, so DIA combines sensitivity, reproducibility, precision, scalability for proteomic experiments. The micropack allows high peak capacity for long gradients, longer than two hours, with very high reproducibility. We achieve CVs around 6% and the 99% data set completeness. We have a very robust separation. We basically looked at it and how reproducible or how big the XIC extraction window is. And for these ones, we had a width from 2%. And for our in-house pack columns, usually around 4 to 5%. So in summary, the micropack and DIA enables a single-shot comprehensive proteome analysis covering more than 9,000 proteins in six hours with an FDR of 1%. With that, I would like to thank the whole R&D team of Biognosis, especially Roland Ruderer, who acquired 
um, the last sample set, um, the healer record runs. And from Farmflutics, I would like to thank especially Jeff and Paul, who came to our lab to install the first micro pack that we had. And with that, I would like to hand over to Laura again. Thank you very much, Jan. I now have two more polling questions for everyone in the audience. And once again, you can click directly on your screen to enter your answers. So this next question is up on your screen. And as you can see, it says, are you considering data independent acquisition or DIA methods? I'm using DIA already. I'm interested in DIA in the near future. Or I'm not interested and I'm happy with my current workflow or workflows. So once again, you can, you can click directly on your screen to enter your answer. And that question again is, are you considering data independent acquisition methods? And the possible answers are, I'm using DIA already. I am interested in DIA in the near future. Or I'm not interested and I'm happy with my current workflow. OK. Let's bring up that result. Hmm, we've got kind of a wide range of answers there with almost evenly split between people who are using DIA or want to use it in the future. Fantastic. OK, we have just one last question for all of you in the audience. And that question is now on your screen. And it says, are you considering a data independent acquisition method in combination with the micropillar array column? And the answer possibilities are, I'm using it already. Or I'm interested in trying this combination in the near future. Or I'm not interested and I'm happy with my current workflow. So once again, click directly on your screen to answer. And that question one last time is, are you considering a data independent acquisition method in combination with the micropillar array column? I'm using it already. I'm interested in trying this combination in the near future. Or I'm not interested and I'm happy with my current workflow. All right, let's pull those results. So the vast majority, about 83%, said that they're interested in trying the combination in the near future. Excellent. All right, so I'd like to pass it off to Jeff for a few closing remarks. So it seems uh, a lot of people are interested in, uh, in using uh, our uh, columns in combination with uh, data independent acquisition methods. So if you are interested in one of our products, you can find all information and application notes on our website. We currently have two types of columns on the shelf a 50 centimeter and a 200 centimeter long column, and each column has been functionalized with C18 and is end capped. So with a column volume of 3 microliter and a flow rate range of 0 0.1 to 2 microliter per minute, the 50 centimeter micro per column is ideally suited to perform this, this more routine analysis where increased throughput is needed. And for those who are aiming to this really comprehensive proteome coverage, uh, the 200 centimeter long column with a volume of 9 microliter and a flow rate range of 0 0.1 to 1 microliter per minute is, uh, is the column you should use. Um, to conclude, we also distribute a micropack uh, column easy spray emitter um, that can be ordered from our website. Thank you again uh, for your attention, and we are happy to try and answer all of your questions. Back to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Jeff. It is indeed time for the question and answer period with the audience. As a reminder, if you would like to submit a question, you can do that by typing it in the Q&A box, which you can find on the right-hand side of the window, of your window. All right, so let's get started. So here's the first question. What is the typical number of injections on a micropack column that can be done until the column needs to be replaced? So I think we, we have already uh, done some experiments um, on the micropack column regarding longevity. So we, we operated the column during six months uh, without any loss of, uh, of, of uh, column performance. So it was a, an experiment where we continuously injected HeLa samples um, with in between some, some reference material to, to check the retention. And the column survived these six months or 2,500 total runs. So for the time being, we do not really know what the limit of this column is. I do need to say with it that it is a, a HeLa sample, uh, so it, it's, it's a quite clean sample. Um, so it, it will also depend on, on what sample type or, or what sample prep you're using for your uh, samples. Excellent. Here's another question. 
Have you done any applications of the micropillar array columns using non-proteomics or typical LC conditions for pharmaceutical analysis, such as an impurity method using a flow rate of 0.5 milliliters per minute? Um, we, we have already done a lot of other type of uh, separations. I think in, in the field of metabolomics um, um, or in, in the field of uh, peptide mapping. Uh, and also for, for the analysis of, of antibodies, of course, uh, where we did uh, peptide mapping of, um, of just a single protein and, and, and antibody. Um, and these application notes are also available uh, on the website. But of course, you can also use this column, the same column that we use for, for proteomics, um, for the separation of lipidomes or metabolomes. Excellent, thank you. Here's another question. This person says, maybe I missed it, but what is the carryover of the column? And what washing procedure have you used for a six hour gradient? So maybe I should answer this one. Um, I'm not sure. Jeff, what do you think? Yes, yes, you can answer because it's, uh, it's regarding the six hour uh, gradient method. Yeah, at, at this point, actually, we didn't uh, assess the carryover. I would just assume based on the low CV um, across the um, replicates, that is actually rather low. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's anything accumulating on the column. At this point, we just used 10, I think 15 minutes wash step at the end, but we didn't really look into whether it's too long or too short at this point. All right, here's another question. We use a trap elute setup with our nano LC column. Is a trap column unnecessary with the MicroPack 200 um, column, 200 centimeter column, I think that means? So it, it of course depends. I think in, in this configuration, all the experiments uh, were performed using using a direct injection. So but this, this puts some, some kind of a constraint on your sample concentration. If you are working with very low uh, concentrated samples, um, then of course trapping uh, would be beneficial. Um, but at the time being, um, we do not have our own trapping columns yet. So we are developing them and they will be available soon. And this is actually important because um, if you're combining a trapping column with an analytical column, the stationary phases should be, um, should be adapted to each other. Because if you would have a trapping column that has more attention than the analytical column, um, the peptides uh, will, will elude broader uh, or, or won't have uh, enough retention on the analytical column. So that's why it's crucial for us to also provide trapping columns, uh, but they will be available soon also. Thank you. Jeff, just a quick note, no, your audio is not quite as clear as it was at the beginning of the, the web seminar, so I don't know if there's an adjustment that you can make. No. Um, so here's another question. Will further separation phases, apart from C18, become available in the near future? So at the time being, we are we're doing um, research uh, on this topic because we, we already got a lot of questions uh, regarding this, and we're looking into um, different chemistries such as helic, um, but at the time being, uh, we do not have them uh, for sale yet. So there are helic uh, type of chemistries we are working on, but we're also looking towards uh, shorter chain um, uh, reversed phase uh, chemistries such as C8 or C4 um, to do more uh, protein, intact protein work uh, on the columns. Right. Your audio is better. Thank you. We have a follow-up question yeah. on the qu or an earlier question. It says the question on the number of injections refers to practical uses by usage by Dr. Montel. Sorry, can you please repeat it? Not sure whether I got sure. it. Sure. So, because the original question was, what is the typical number of of injections that you can do on the micro pack column? before the column needs to be replaced. And so now the person is confirming that they want to know from your direct experience of using it, what your experience has been in terms of how often you have to replace the column. Okay, so far we didn't replace the column at all. So all of the injections that I showed today were acquired on the same column. So 
I cannot really answer on it, so we just have it on for maybe uh, a week uh, at once. Then you have to change again to a regular setup because you just wanted to evaluate at this point. But so far, um, we just ran everything on the same column. Thank you. Here's a new question. Is the use of nonlinear gradient, gradients straightforward and compatible with the use of IRT standards? Or does the RT calculation have to be modified? So actually, the IRT calibration, or we now call it high-precision IRT, so in the software itself, there are now several thousand calibration peptides in it. So actually, the software is actually designed to deal with nonlinear gradients. Because you also use the Mutini anyway, and therefore it's optimized for that. How easily can a DIA method be implemented on my system? Um, so it's actually rather easy. So we also have some pre-prepared um, um, pre-prepared uh, methods that you can hand out to customers. So basically, you give us which full width half max you expect from your system, and then we can provide you with a method for it. There is always room for, for a little bit more improvement, but also as you can see maybe in my presentation, usually um, it's around 10 to 20% that can optimize on top of that. So usually the AA method works quite well from the beginning. Is there any chance of micro pack columns with an even higher flow rate or higher flow rates to further enhance sample throughput? So I think it's it's regarding the 50 centimeter column. So this this has a maximum uh, flow rate of two microliter per minute, which is already quite high. But we are, um, as a matter of fact, also looking uh, into developing columns for for a higher. Um, flow rate range. So, but this is also something that we are still doing R&D um, towards, and, and that will soon, uh, I think, somewhere next year, uh, become will become available on the market. But for the time being, our 50-centimeter uh, comb with a flow rate of 2 microliter per minute is, um, is the highest throughput that we can offer with our system. Very good. How often do you change the spray emitter tip? Um, I think perhaps that's so probably something that's, for Jan. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You can also answer, Jeff, I think. No, no. I think I it's know. it's better for you because you have, uh, I, I think it's regarding your setup perhaps uh, because you have some practical experience with it. Yeah, I think at the moment we, we change a little bit more frequently with our regular setup, um, but it's still maybe once per week maximum in that range. I think there's still some room for improvement there, but I don't. Uh, but we still want to change. Also, uh, check out the other ionization method, like uh, um, the liquid junction injection, which we haven't tried yet. Mm. No. How is the stationary phase supported by the pillars? So. Um, actually, the pillars. Huh? The pillars are first defined into silicon by etching. And then afterwards, the the pillars are made superficially porous by anodization. So, so the actual pillar is made uh, porous. So the pores are, are inside the pillar surface. Um, and then afterwards, we we attach um, a chemical modification, for instance, C18 uh, to this uh, inside the pores. I think this is more or less the answer for the question. Fantastic. Well, with that, I think we should wrap up. Uh, Jeff and Jan, thank you very much for your presentations and for answering all those questions today. Thank you very much. No, thanks. No, thank you. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for attending and participating in today's event. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pharmafluidics and Biognosis AG, for making today's webcast possible. At the end of today's webcast, a brief survey will appear on your screen. We hope that you'll take a moment to complete the survey. You will also later receive an email from LCGC alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. We hope to see you all next time. Goodbye. <laughs>